welcome everybody to this Labour for European Future and Leads for Europe event. So I'm very proud to be joined by Hilary Benn, uh, Member of Parliament, Natalie Bennett from the Green Party and the Lords and Richard Wilson from Leads for Europe. And the, the context for the discussion is, is obviously Brexit and uh, over five months now into, you know, real Brexit, if you like, rather than the pretend Brexit we had last year. And what we're looking at today really is how we can improve the relationship between the UK and the EU. Uh, looking further ahead. So, of course, this is a we're a Labour organisation, but this is, and uh, Hillary's a Labour MP, uh, but this is a, a cross party um, meeting. Natalie, of course, from the Greens, um, and I'm sure there'll be others in the meeting as well with, um, you know, different political affiliations or no political affiliation at all. But all of us, presumably, relatively or very uh, pro European and uh, not, not thrilled by, by Brexit. So, I'm looking forward to what will be an interesting conversation. So, the format will be uh, I'll go to the three speakers uh, first and then we'll have time for Q&A afterwards. If you would like to ask a question, uh, you can either uh, raise your hand using the raise hand feature in the reactions uh, tab, or if you prefer, you can write your question in the chat um, and I will ask your question at the end. And if it's to a specific person, then obviously put that in there. Uh, we'll get through as many as we can. Um, but without further ado, Hilary, I will come to you first. So we would, we'd love to hear what you have to say. And thank you again for joining. Well, Mike, thank you very much indeed for inviting me and thanks to all of you for giving up your evening for this extremely important discussion. Um, much as we might want to dwell on what happened and how we got here, uh, we have now left the European Union. Brexit has happened and a, a new question has hoved into view, a new political question. It's not whether people were for or against Brexit anymore. The question is, what kind of relationship do we now wish to have, given that Brexit has happened, with our biggest, nearest and most important trading partners, our friends in the other EU member states? Um, now, it's a very practical question because as the reality of Brexit has unfolded with the end of the transition period, because a, a lot of the consequence was hidden by the transition period, but from the 1st of January, um, the truth has been revealed and we have seen the consequences from fishermen in Scotland and elsewhere having difficulty in getting their um, catch to market. Uh, the red tape, the cost, the bureaucracy that firms have had to deal with, and that's particularly hard for small, medium sized enterprises. We've had musicians and performers and stage technicians uh, complaining about the difficulties that have now been created for those who wish to tour in Europe and indeed for European artists and performers who want to uh, tour here. A lot of supply chains are under pressure. And to be frank, uh, I think in the medium term, we are likely to see a change in those supply chains because we've come out of an, uh, an arrangement because of the single market in the customs union, where it was as easy to move goods from uh, Frankfurt to Leeds as it was to move them from Bradford to Leeds. Well, that is no longer the case. And, and by the way, the one thing that hasn't happened yet is the application of checks on goods coming mm -hmm. into the UK. So it's been a one way consequence uh, at the moment. And who knows what we will find when the UK government finally gets round to applying those uh, checks. There have been some changes already because of the way they have chosen to apply VAT. And that has led some European suppliers to say, well, I'm not going to supply the, Euro the UK market anymore. Uh, we have the trade and cooperation agreement that was um, finally reached on Christmas Eve. Uh, it proved, I think, that those of us who fought really hard against leaving the European Union and the transition period with no deal were right, obviously, to do so. And what the TCA did was to make what is going to be pretty bad for the British economy overall in terms of foregone economic opportunity, slightly less bad than it would otherwise have been. And in particular, it has avoided tariffs on the trading goods, although that hasn't helped uh, when it comes to businesses that import goods from the rest of the world and then want to uh, export them to the EU because of the rules of origin 
arrangements, which are quite complicated, and we didn't get what we wanted. So I think the first thing I would say is that we need to use the provisions of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, which explicitly recognises the possibility of future agreements to supplement it between the UK and the EU to try and address these particular difficulties that we are now seeing. For example, for artists and musicians, why can we not reach an agreement with the EU that allows for a period of time uh, artists from the EU to come to the UK, the UK to go to the EU without carnets and cabotage and uh, visas and all of that stuff. Secondly, we have the Northern Ireland Protocol, which is probably the most acute difficulty at the moment. Uh, we know the history of that. Um, it was originally offered to Theresa May and she said no. Boris Johnson, when he wasn't prime minister, said no conservative leader would ever agree to a border in the Irish Sea. And when he became prime minister, that's promptly what he did by saying, OK, I'll take a border in the Irish Sea and the EU said to him, well, all right, we did offer that to Theresa May previously, and she said no, but if you're prepared to accept it, fine. And that's what the withdrawal uh, agreement with the Northern Ireland Protocol consisted of, what had already been negotiated, plus a border in the Irish Sea. And now in the last few days, we've had uh, ministers saying, implying, well, we weren't entirely uh, sure what we'd signed up to. I think it was pretty clear what they had signed up to. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a difficulty because of the political sensitivities of Northern Ireland, where we have seen uh, people doing checks in Belfast uh, walk away from their job because they are afraid. Uh, we have seen real problems in moving certain goods from uh, the GB to the Northern Ireland like seed potatoes or packages or secondhand tractors which have soil on them. And my view is that we have to come to a sensible arrangement with the European Union about how the protocol is going to be applied because the EU accepted in the negotiations that Northern Ireland is unlike you know anywhere else when it said um, we will have checks according to the risk that goods will enter the Republic of Ireland and through the Republic, the rest of the EU, because the one thing that everybody in the Brexit negotiations agreed on was that there could be no return to a hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic. And so if you take a, a very practical example, a lorry load of goods from, say, Asda, heading across the Irish Sea to go to Asda stores in Northern Ireland, should they all require an export health certificate? Well, um, those some in the EU say the rules is the rules is the rules. They've all got to have one. Um, I think that's wrong. I don't see what the risk of those goods entering the European Union is in practice, apart from someone from Donegal driving to a supermarket in Londonderry, filling up with their weekly shopping, and the goods might end up in a fridge or a freezer in a house in Donegal, but that's hardly going to be entering for general circulation, the Republic of Ireland and therefore the rest of the European Union. And I think it's really important that the negotiators are able to reach a flexible agreement. And we as strong supporters of uh, Europe and our membership of the European Union before we lost the Brexit referendum, cannot end up in the position where we are saying, uh, oh yeah, we agree with Europe, the rules is the rules is the rules, because I think that would be a profound mistake in my view, for us to do that. Because actually the Northern Ireland Protocol puts Northern Ireland in really quite a privileged position. At the moment, that's not how it's seen by some people in Northern Ireland. We've seen the recent change of leadership in the DUP. Um, because once uh, it's working, the place in the United Kingdom where you would want to invest if you want to have access both to the, the GB and the EU market is Northern Ireland. So actually, it it gives Northern Ireland an enormous economic opportunity. But at the moment, the debate is, with some people, well, the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, can't survive. And the final point I want to make, and I think on the checks, there is a, a perfectly uh, easily negotiated solution, which is an agreement on uh, veterinary checks. After all, New Zealand has an agreement with uh, uh, the European Union on this. And because we know that the UK government will not accept 
uh, automatically agreeing to sign up to all new European regulations and will not accept the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. That is a red line. I think the way through that is the way through the negotiators found to deal with the issue of the level playing field. And I think the UK government should say, we of our own newly sovereign volition decide that we will, for the time being, observe European rules. After all, that's what we've been doing since the 30th of December. They haven't changed. Um, we may decide to diverge from them in the future if a new trade agreement goes into view that we think gives us um, greater advantages, but there's no sign of that currently. And there's a reportedly a huge row going on in the government at the moment about whether agricultural products from Australia should get tariff-free access to the UK as part of a UK-Australia trade deal. And if the EU thinks that we are then veering away from that, it can take unilateral action against us. Now, that's what they did for the level playing field. I think that's the way forward on veterinary agreements. And the final point I want to make is this. For anything to happen that will lead to sensible agreements being negotiated, uh, the politics in the UK and the EU has to change. In the UK's case, the government has to accept that it did not negotiate a fantastic agreement in the TCA. We all know it went for the hardest Brexit possible, but they've got to get over that and recognize, all right, there's some problems here that we need to fix and we will be open to a further agreement being reached. And on the EU side, the EU has to recognize, okay, we've made the point that a member state that leaves is gonna suffer and is gonna lose out. Now we need to take a pragmatic view of building a better economic relationship in our mutual interest between um, uh, the UK and uh, the EU. And for those, and some may argue on the conversation today, that the issue at the next election should be rejoining the European Union. I don't think that's where the politics is. And I think I'll say that up front. And anyone who argues that has got to stand up first and argue for another referendum, because there's no question of us would, there would be no question of us rejoining the European Union without another referendum. And again, I don't think that's where the politics are. Now, where the EU will be in uh, the years to come, where the UK will be in the years to come, who's to say? But for the time being, Brexit has happened and we've got to negotiate a better relationship within the context of that change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hilary. Uh, and uh, without breaking um, the sweat, um, we will go to Natalie Bennett. Thank you very much and thank you for inviting me along this evening and thank you for everyone who's giving up what certainly in Sheffield anyway is quite a nice sunny evening to be with us tonight. Um, and I join you in a very appropriate way because I've just come from another Zoom meeting as one does these days, which was with the British chapter of the French Green Party. So I'm very glad to be at this meeting because I'm not having to display my terrible French uh, with a strong Australian accent. Um, and this makes life a great deal easier. Although that really reflects one of the first points I want to make, because this is a meeting about rebuilding our relationship with Europe. And one of the things that all of us can do and that every single person in the UK can do is one of the things we have to do is strengthen, rebuild, create one-to-one -one relationships, relationships between towns and cities, twinning type arrangements, keep the lines of communication open, build new lines of communication. Because of course, we tend to focus very much on what the government's doing. Um, and we can't control what messages Boris Johnson is sending out to the world, out to the West of Europe. And you know, the main speaker on the event I was speaking at was uh, Sandrine Rousseau, who's one of the candidates for the um, uh, French uh, for the uh, uh, French uh, presidency for the Greens. They, they, they haven't selected yet, and that's all very complicated. But um, uh, she was she's very much she identifies as an eco feminist and talks about issues of feminism and issues of leadership. And she was citing, you know, cases of bad leadership around the world. And you can probably guess what was in the number one slot for her examples of bad leadership. Um, so we really have to make sure that all of Europe is hearing the message that what they might hear from Boris Johnson or the British government doesn't necessarily reflect the views of the people of the UK. And I think those personal relationships are really important and something that everyone can contribute to. Um, the other thing, I mean, I agree with a great deal of what Hillary said, so I won't track over the same territory. Um, but I think one of the things to focus on is that we are going to have to talk about 
particularly environmental issues and environment related issues. You, um, as I was sadly campaigning very hard and failing to keep us in the European Union, I was pointing out on the issue of fish that, you know, fish don't swim around with passports tucked under one fin. If they did that, they'd only be able to swim around in circles. Um, and fish cross national boundaries, um, which is also, of course, the case of air pollution, water pollution, all of these issues that we have to work together on, um, that you know, each is a impact, our decisions impact on the others. And we have to keep fighting those issues and you know, saying we have to cooperate on those issues and the, those, those things, points have to be made. And the other thing I'd agree very much with Hilary on is, is the whole issue of our musicians, our creative sector. Um, you know, they have been totally dumped in it. Of course, COVID has magnified the problem, but, it, it, but in some ways it's also masked the problem in that the inability to travel because of COVID has masked just how difficult the current situation is. And we've really got to be fighting hard for that creative sector and doing our best and also, you know, much of the other services sector as well, you know, whether it's architects or accountants or all sorts of, you know, um, I was hearing someone in the house today saying, you know, the creative sector, the service sector had a hard Brexit. And that's very much the case. And, you know, the, the phrase was get Brexit done. And, you know, we've just started Brexit. And so I'd agree with Hillary, now is not the political time to be talking about rejoining the EU. The time now is to open the channels, create links, allow interchanges as much as possible. And I think um, there's an opportunity here for us more broadly, politically, not in, in, a, in a party political sense, but um, the contribution, I don't think enough during the, the referendum campaign was made of the contribution of European citizens um, to British life, to you know, whether it's teaching languages in the schools, whether it's um, you know working in our NHS or you know in our factories or, or farms, all of those things. You know, we now have a chance also to reset the whole debate about migration, um, and that's an opportunity arising out of you know disaster. Um, but it's also really important for all of us to be doing everything we can to stand up for the EU citizens who remain as part of our communities, our friends, our workmates, our family members, um, our neighbours. And you know, I'm working at the moment on a situation where people who are uh, European citizens, but also UK citizens, have just received letters saying, if you don't apply for settled status, um, you risk losing your access to the NHS and your pension and most of the people who seem to be receiving these are people in their 70s and 80s, a dreadful failure by the British government, but also really highlighting the fact that we're going to have to, you know, European citizens are now exposed to the full horrors of the hostile environment. And we're going to have to all of us stand up and you know, do what we can to protect them whenever a problem starts to arise, really leap in to defend them. And finally, just sort of on the whole food and, and good trading goods area. I do perhaps slightly disagree with Hillary here in that I think I understand why Europe is really concerned about a backdoor into the European market. And as, as Hillary cited, the issue of you know, a potential Australian trade deal. And you, uh, anyone who doesn't know it, that's where my accent comes from, Australia, uh, originally Australia. And my first degree was agricultural science. I know a great deal about Australian agriculture um, and it's both terrible environmental practices and also terrible animal welfare standards. Um, and I can understand why the European Union, you know, is very, very cautious about arrangements that might let Australian produce in, or indeed, if we look at the US, um, I was looking at the whole issue of uh, the US is looking to start importing Chinese chicken. And once it disappears into the US, then it's going to be indistinguishable and it could then end up with us. And, you know, I also lived in Thailand for five years and I know something about the standards on, on Thai chicken farms and I would imagine Chinese are roughly comparable and I can understand why the Europeans would be very resistant to that. But I think finally in this area, um, we do also have to think about the practical reality of Brexit, which was also a practical reality that was coming down the line environmentally and socially anyway. We're heading into a world with huge problems of food security. Um, we have a responsibility to produce as much of our own food as possible, not to rely on you know, um, Spanish 
plastic um, greenhouses with employing workers under absolutely dreadful sta you know, standards. We need to grow our own fruit and vegetables. We need to encourage um, a different kind of agriculture, one that doesn't rely on sort of you know, your very young, very fit imported workers working hideous hours for very low pay. Um, some of these changes have to be made anyway, and we need to look at a different kind of model and a different way of doing things. So ultimately, I, I want to finish on a message of hope, which is we don't want to be where we are. It's the old story of how do you get where you want to go where you don't start from here, but we do start from where we are. The good news is that where we are now on all kinds of levels is profoundly unstable. Things are going to change. And we have to start from where we are now and look to build something different and better. And that has to include you know, a good, close, friendly, cooperative relationship with our European neighbours. That really is a statement of the obvious, but something we need to keep saying again and again and again. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, and Richard, we'll come straight across to you. Thanks, Mike. Uh, now. Oh, he's frozen. Just took a long minute. <laughs> We're just going to have to wait for him to, uh, to come back on. Sorry about that. Uh, in the meantime, do please. I want to rejoin the EU and. Uh, Richard, you froze there just as you started off. So you, uh, if you want to start again, that would be Sorry. Right. OK, I'll start again. Uh, yeah, so I was just saying I, I want to rejoin the EU. Uh, Leeds for Europe, who I represent, want to rejoin the EU. But we recognise that it's not going to happen tomorrow. And we recognise that the campaign to rejoin cannot start immediately. Um, we have to get to it step by step. And we're supporting the European movement's approach to this, which is step by step to rejoin. And our priorities at the moment uh, are really twofold. Uh, one is to draw attention of the British public to how Brexit isn't working. Um, we think that the negative impacts of Brexit have had some coverage, but it's been largely overshadowed by COVID, of course. We're about five months out of the extension period. Uh, we have heard snippets, but really the British public have not really been receiving a huge amount of information about um, Brexit and things like uh, the impact on freedom of movement, you know, for people going on holidays and so on, have been completely masked by COVID. And, and those are the sort of things that I think would really make people sit up and take notice. So at Leeds for Europe, we are going to be um, campaigning on that, uh, particularly when COVID starts to recede. Uh, and we, 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 must, we must take the opportunity to ram home and to repeatedly ram home uh, the, the way that Brexit has hit our industry, it's hit our students, it's hit our um, people who want to go and live and work abroad, uh, it's hit our cooperation on international issues like climate change, you know, the, the, the numbers are endless. Now that, that's a negative uh, campaign, but it needs to be done. Um, but we also have a great opportunity to offer a positive uh, agenda. And that's really what I want to focus on more tonight, because there's so we, we've really hit a low point in terms of our relationship with Europe and in terms of the strength of our connections to Europe. We've gone very, very suddenly to a very low point. Um, it, it's hard to imagine we could make things any worse, but I've seen, I think we've all seen that this government is capable of making it even worse. So let's not get too carried away with that. But I do think that there is more opportunity on the upside to actually start to re-establish the, the things that we've lost. And I think most of those things, uh, which I'll come to, um, are actually things that would be popular with the British public when you actually start to itemize them out. Uh, for example, um, removing red tape. Um, you know, people don't like red tape. Uh, and if you told them we're going to remove it, then they would generally welcome that. And we've got masses of red tape now in terms of imports and exports. Uh, we've got customs declarations, we've got certifications, we've got rules about rules of origin. Um, we've got goods being checked when they come, well, they're not, as Hillary said, they're not being checked yet, but they will be when they come in. We've got goods being checked when they cross the Irish Sea. 
absolute nightmare. And who would not welcome uh, removal as at least some or even all of those uh, rules of, and that red tape and that bureaucracy. Um, ultimately, you know, I'm, I'm hinting at if we were able to go a long way along that road, we would be looking at uh, re rejoining the customs union as a basic thing, which I, I honestly think the British public would welcome that and businesses would welcome it. Uh, and I would, um, incidentally, it would solve the Northern Irish problem at a stroke as a byproduct. Um, just a bit of a more down to earth thing and, and something less contentious, uh, something that we're doing in Leeds for Europe is we're looking at re-establishing cultural connections with Europe. Um, we're really keen to press twinning and uh, exchanges. We're working with the city council on this. We uh, have had a couple of meetings on it and we want to give our support to um, the city council and the twinning program and really give it a boost of, of energy because I do feel that uh, getting the people of Leeds and Yorkshire to feel some warmth towards our European friends in Dortmund and Lille and Brno and other places would be um, a good way of work for in the longer term to rejoin uh, and there are so many different ways and we've talked about twinning and exchanges but there are just so many different ways that you can generate cultural connections musical connections Someone's um, cultural connections sporting food art music um, and not to mention Erasmus, which we a lot of us uh, would like to see brought back. These are all ways of creating that warmth between people in this country and in Europe. And these are presumably the reasons why the government uh, is actually shutting it all down, because they don't want British people to have an affinity with Europe, because it would actually start to undermine their project. Um, I would like to see um, much greater harmonisation of rules. I think that's a pragmatic thing. Uh, Things like equivalence of qualifications, things like consumer rights, things like, you know, when you buy a car in the UK, you would want it to be the same as the car that you would buy in Europe. Why, why on earth would you want different standards for products uh, in the UK from Europe? And frankly, that applies across the board. Why on earth would we want lower standards in our consumer products than they have in Europe? I cannot think of a good reason for that. And I think most British people would be a, a bit affronted if you told them we actually want to have worse products in this country than they have in Europe. So these are just, to me, these are all popular and practical ways that we can rebuild our connections with Europe. And they're all taking us back in the right direction uh, where we want to ultimately go. But we're not forcing people. We're just putting a few steps on the road. Um, finally, um, there's a bigger, bigger picture, really, of cooperation with Europe, having a friendly relationship, you know, what, such that we can work together on those really big issues. Climate change, tax evasion, modern slavery, people trafficking, um, scientific research and cooperation on health, you know, with the, the pandemics going on. Uh, obviously, these are, these are areas where a collaborative relationship with Europe is so much more beneficial than a confrontational relationship and uh, again I, I think the British public would see that so I, th so I think if you've got all these ingredients that I've just listed as as ways that we can rebuild our relationship with Europe and that in, in my view they're all positive they're all popular and pragmatic then I think the British people would welcome nearly all of those ideas and it would actually make them start to think really would we be better off having a much much closer relationship in other words why don't we just go back into the eu now that's in the long term but it, these are all the building bricks of getting to that position uh, and the final one i really want to, to mention is uh, freedom of movement um as i said this has hardly been noticed really because we've lost our freedom of movement with the virus and, and unable to, to travel freely across borders but to me, the, the idea that I am now trapped in this country and I cannot go to um, Europe for more than 90 days in 180 and things like that. I can't uh, freely go and um, settle anywhere else and buy a property and, and, and get a job. Um, 
and study, I, I, I think it is utterly objectionable. And it's something that I think a lot of people should be upset at the idea that they've lost their freedom. And it's something that I would really like to see our political parties, uh, including the Labour Party, uh, put on the agenda to bring back. We want our freedom back. We want our freedom of movement back. And I know that um, people don't like immigration, but they need to understand there's a flip side to that. And we have absolutely shot ourselves in the foot by taking away our freedom of movement. So um, fundamentally, um, I am sort of looking at Hillary here, but also at Natalie to say that in my view, you could create a really positive agenda for your parties if you adopted some of these ideas. Uh, I think it would show the public that you have direction, that you differentiate yourself from the Conservatives and that you have a really strong positive vision for the future of the UK. Um, I think that what that would achieve for our country is that it would reverse the direction of travel that we have experienced over the last five years and it would actually start to move us towards Europe instead of wrenching away. That in itself would be a, a positive move. It would just be swinging the pendulum back the other way. Uh, and I think it would cause people to start to reappraise their attitudes to Europe and to start to wonder, would we be better off in the EU, EU after all? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Richard, and also to Natalie and Hillary once again. Um, all right, there's been a bunch of questions asked in the chat, so I will go through those. If anybody wants to ask a question out loud, you can raise your hand in the reactions tab, or if you've got questions you want to type in the chat, then, then please go ahead. Otherwise, I'm sure we'll, we'll all manage to find things to talk about. So um, the first, one of the first questions that was asked, and this can go both to Hillary and to uh, Natalie, and this is discussed uh, I think somebody mentions it, it to me probably every day, which is, is really the idea of a progressive alliance. Um, and normally that, that kind of comes down to uh, an alliance between the Greens, Lib Dems and the Labour Party. The idea being that if you add up all of our shares of vote, uh, then you suddenly get a magic number that beats the Conservative Party. Uh, personally, I am uh, not convinced by that, um, but... I've seen, basically, I've seen evidence saying, yes, this could work, and I've seen actually probably more evidence saying, well, it really wouldn't work, because voters don't like being told what to do. Yeah. But you're here to find out what I think. So, uh, Natalie, uh, can you give us your perspective and perhaps the, the Green perspective as well, and then I'll come to Hillary. Well, I think you're absolutely right in terms of um, that you, it's very difficult to direct from the centre and say to voters, this is what you expect you to do, and we're going to cheat you like pieces, chess pieces on a, on a, on a board, moving them around. Um, however, I think what we're actually seeing in a really positive thing, and this is happening right literally as we speak, is that um, at a local level, having just been through local elections, which you know, there was a lot of focus on some negative results for the Labour Party, but there are also lots of negative results for the Conservative Party. Um, and there are lots of um, councils now in no overall control. I suspect more councils than ever before in no overall control. And we're seeing all sorts of different organising happening at a local level. I mean, I know Sheffield Greens are meeting tonight to talk about what happens with Sheffield Council in no overall control. And our proposal is that we actually have a rainbow coalition of the you know, broadly progressive parties running the council. And so I think, you know, I, you know, the green door is always open. We're always happy to talk. We've actually taken considerable political hits, taken great cost in the past trying to make this happen. Um, but I think with the best hope really is for, to see things happening at a local level, people learning to work together. You know, what we're doing is actually working in a continental style way, like the kind of coalitions that happen with proportional representation politics on the continent. Uh, their voters are actually making those choices in the UK. And so what we're seeing is at a local level, rearrangements, realignments of politics. And rather than one big central decision down in Westminster that allocates seats in certain ways, et cetera, is that actually we can see you know, a just real alignment of British politics. And you know, from the perspective of Greens, you know, we always argue for proportional representation, for a fair voting system, for a democratic voting system. But we've also shown that we can beat first past the post anyway, as we've done in all these recent elections. So I think you, we have to 
look towards the vision of the future rather than necessarily, you know, the old metaphorical smoke filled rooms and, you know, the, the, the puff of smoke emerging from them with the decision. We have to look in a much more flexible, fluid, constructive, working together kind of way. That's got to be the foundation, but it's not necessarily one central decision from Westminster. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, straight across to you, Hilary. Well, I agree, because I don't think you can say to, to Green voters, you're not allowed to vote Green because you've got to vote for a Labour candidate because we've divided it up between us, or to say to Labour voters, you can't vote Labour because you've got to vote for a Lib Dem or any combination you wish to make. Having said that, Natalie's absolutely right, all over the country, and this is not a new phenomenon, voters make a judgment in areas, if they really, really, for example, don't want a Conservative Member of Parliament, you see how voters make a judgment to rally behind the person they think can best prevent that from happening. Now, that's why I'm in favour for the Commons of AV. We had a referendum in 2011. We were roundly trounced, even quite a modest change, because that allows people to vote uh, and have their vote counted at every stage. So you can vote Labour first in a seat where Labour, with the best will in the world, is never going to win. And then you can work up to others that you would be prepared to vote for in those circumstances. By the way, I'm in favour of a PR elected House of Lords. But that's another debate for a, uh, I think, for another uh, time. The much, well, it's not the bigger question. The bigger question is how do we change the politics of uh, the country? and the attitude of the 52% to Brexit. And I, I, I saw that I've been looking at the questions that have been coming in. And I thought Adrian made a really interesting point about identity because we focused a lot in the conversation this evening so far on the economic consequences. But let's be frank, there are a lot of people who voted for Brexit who said, um, and I had conversation like this, I don't care what the economic consequences are, getting my sovereignty back is more important than that. And we are living now in an era in which there are two great forces at work in Britain, in Europe. We saw it in the United States of America. On the one hand is the cry for devolution, independence, sovereignty, control, because people have seen, particularly those who feel they've been left behind by change, uh, think, well, I've had no control over this. So when someone turns up and says, uh, would you like a bit more control over what happens in your life? Don't be surprised if people say yes please and on the other hand the absolute necessity for greater cooperation between nation states to deal with climate change trade threats to peace and security environmental refugees and the brexit referendum for me was about the balance between the two because like all things in life our own relationships the natural environment climate change that's a consequence of getting the balance wrong and i think the same is true here. And I also think that there is a lesson for the European Union, because anyone who thinks now the UK's left, the EU will go back to ever faster, closer, deeper union. I don't think that's where the politics is in, is in a large number of EU member states. And the, one of the really interesting questions is how the European Union is going to evolve over the years ahead. And I am in favour of President Macron's approach. He referred to concentric circles where you have degrees of cooperation, because that is a way, it seems to me, of encouraging more people to be part of the enterprise rather than saying you've got to sign up to all of this. And after all, debate has been raised in the questions. If we rejoin, are we going to have to join the euro? And I think not joining the euro was the right decision for the British economy. Thank goodness for Gordon Brown. Great. Thank you, Hilary. Um, right, let's move on to some more questions. Uh, Kate Freeman, you have your hand up, um, so I'll come to you. Uh, hi, hello. Um, th thank you very much for asking the, the, the very first question, which I put in the chat. Um, behind my question was about pragmatism, not, not dog dogmatism. It wasn't about dictating to any voter what they should be doing. What was behind it was a very political question, bearing in mind we are where we are under first past the post. It is what it is, and it's hit and miss. Uh, tactical voting is not really working. It votes, it works occasionally. So what I was wanting to ask really behind that question about merging is a merger of political alignment. 
uh, we can't uh, say that, you know, the Greens are very distinct from Labour and vice versa. When it comes to green policy, you've both got very strong green um, hopes and ambitions. Socially, not that far apart. You can influence each other. In other words, there could be an alliance that doesn't have to, so that when people are voting, they know they're voting for uh, policies that are merging much more. And I, I just sort of feel there must be an imaginative way of being able to be progressive together without being dictating to the voters. And I'm sure there's an imaginative way forward. Great, thank you, Kate. Um, I'll let um, speakers comment on that in a, in a second. I'm just gonna come to Alan's question and then we can take both because uh, we, we haven't got that much time left. Go ahead, Alan. Thank you, by the way, Kate. I can't hear you, Alan. He's on mute. <laughs> oh, hello. Sorry, did you mean me or another Alan? I meant Alan Hick. Can you hear oh. me now? Yes. Ah, very good. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much for very inspiring uh, speeches and, and interventions. I would be interested in hearing something about dynamic alignment with popular policies. Um, for instance, my own uh, preference would be workers' rights, social rights. Why aren't we saying more as a progressive movement about how we should, whatever the situation be, trying to align more with, um, with the dynamic uh, uh, developments in Europe on, on workers' rights, uh, environmental rights, citizens' rights, uh, and so on. So a little bit more on dynamic alignment. Secondly, I was really enthusiastic about this, uh, about Richard's uh, contribution on, uh, on cultural links, on, on doing things locally. Um, um, unfortunately, in a way, I'm based in Brussels. I can't do very much locally uh, in Britain. But um, couldn't we, I don't know, launch something like a European, European club movement you know, uh, some, something where we could just get in touch uh, more often. I, I'm all in favor of twinning and, and, uh, and, and cultural exchanges and Erasmus and everything, but why can't we have European clubs in Leeds, in, in, uh, in where I come from, from Teesside, from, uh, in, in Brussels, uh, and, and, and have uh, a, a sort of cultural link where we can get in touch with each other, where we can... Um, uh, use uh, use Zoom, but also maybe eventually meet up and uh, and um, and just get a European feel again about about everything and 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 just feel European again. So I'd be for um, launching European clubs in in every centre if that's possible. Great, uh, thank you, Alan. Right, uh, Richard, I'll come to you first. Thanks, Mike. Um, um, I didn't actually see Kate's question exactly as it's worded, but I'll try and guess from what she said. I mean, it was basically if if Labour and the Greens are um, have such similarities in in many areas, why don't they collaborate or cooperate more closely in a progressive alliance type way? Uh, I just want to shoot that down, to be honest, because frankly, the Green Party's policy on uh, the EU and the Labour Party's current policy on the EU are worlds apart. And I, as a Green Party member myself, I would not be at all happy with adopting uh, the Labour Party's position or merging with the Labour Party's position. So if the Labour Party wants to be part of a progressive alliance with the Greens or the Lib Dems, um, for me and for many people here, a, a, a reasonable position on Brexit on the EU is absolutely vital. Uh, otherwise, I don't. I, I, I think it's questionable whether you can call the Labour Party a progressive party in respect of Europe at the moment. I'm afraid. I'm sorry to say that at a Labour for a European Future event, but you know that, that that's that's how a lot of us feel. Um, moving on to the question of dynamic alignment. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it sort of picks up on what I was saying. Really, is that in terms of stuff like employment rights and consumer rights, I can't really think of any good reason why we would want to have worse, worse uh, rules and regulations than Europe. If someone wants to openly state why they want um, worse 
consumer rights in the UK than in Europe, then they should say so. But I've not, I've not heard it. In five years of campaigning, I've not heard a single Brexit supporter explain to me why they want to change the rules, why they want to um, detach from European Union rules on anything, uh, to be honest. Uh, I don't, and, and as Hillary said, when you ask people, would you vote for Brexit if it made you economically worse off? They say yes, because they don't care about the money. Um, would you vote for Brexit if it meant um, your products were inferior? They'd probably say yes, because they don't do it for, for that. Um, but therefore, there is no reason at all why we shouldn't um, adopt EU rules on things uh, such as consumer rights or employment, employment, employment rights, because the Brexiters themselves do not, do not have a problem with that. Um, Cultural links, European clubs. I mean, we've just moved into this area with twinning, as I mentioned. Um, we, we are aware, I mean, there are a lot of existing arrangements. There are a lot of twinning arrangements, some quite sophisticated and, and energetic and some less so. And there are various uh, UK stroke European uh, associations, you know, quite tend to be a single nation. So you might have a UK German friendship association or UK French friendship association. So I know they do exist. Uh, we're trying to build a bit of a directory of them, to be honest. I'm working with the European movement on this, and we're trying to collate information about all of these type of relationships that exist and, and therefore perhaps look to fill any gaps and to, and to stimulate the whole, the whole movement. Um, I think, I'm not sure if there's a, such thing as a, a UK-Europe club, which is a nice idea. Uh, as Peter Packham says, in Leeds, Leeds for Europe is the European club. So please, uh, if you're into that, come and join us. Um, but if it's more of a cultural thing, that, that's certainly, I think, something worth worth adding to the, the list. Great, thank you, Richard. Right, I'm gonna to come to Hillary with a couple of Labour questions, if that's all right. Okay. Um, so uh, a number of people have asked similar questions. So one person asked about Keir's position and why he isn't more outwardly uh, pro-European. Uh, someone mentioned uh, Andy Burnham the other day saying that we need to embrace Brexit uh, and asking why he isn't, isn't more pro-European. Uh, and then probably, in, in a way, probably a question that lies somewhat at the root of all this is, is how does Labour appeal to both Leave and Remain voters? And I suppose the second part to that question is, well, will Leave and Remain voters even be relevant once we get to 2022 or 2023? So, so I guess in a way the question is, how does Labour win the next election, Hillary? <laughs> Well, that is the £64,000 or dollar uh, question. Given the, look, Brexit split the nation right down the middle. That's what it did. And uh, the reason I touched on uh, Adrian's point about identity is people still feel that uh, extremely strongly. And I I think it's it's harsh, to put it mildly, to... Uh, look at Keir and say he's gone from being someone who, who led from the front as the shadow Brexit secretary to somehow not being um, good enough now. I don't think that that is uh, fair at all. And I think he is taking the right approach and he's spoken out about it. Rachel Reeves has done so when she was at the cabinet office. Uh, I have done so and others. It's how you start the process of encouraging people to think about the future relationship we're going to have with the EU. And that is not, in my view, by saying, um, excuse me, the 52%, can I just tell you again how wrong you were? Now, would you just get your, your vote and your views in order and listen to me if I speak at you a little bit more loudly? I'm afraid that is not the way in which we're going to win uh, the next election. And I mean, there was a question that was asked, I was in the middle of trying to reply to it about the vote on the trade and cooperation agreement, because that led to some criticism. Just to be absolutely clear about that, Brexit was happening anyway. Labour is not a Brexit party. So if anyone says we should embrace Brexit, well, I'm not doing that as, uh, as long as I'm still breathing. And we didn't because we voted against the withdrawal agreement. And it's really important to remember that, but the withdrawal agreement went through. And when the trade and cooperation agreement arrived, it was simply a choice between a deal, albeit not a brilliant one, and no deal. 
and having bust a gut and taken a lot of criticism and abuse from people for campaigning to prevent no deal, there was no way I was voting to enable no deal to happen. And it hasn't stopped us criticizing the consequences of that deal, as I did in my opening remarks. And uh, it, it doesn't mean that we're, we're compromised in some way. And the truth about the TCA is if probably for every single person on this call, if your vote had been the difference between the TCA passing or not passing 10% tariff on cars, huge damage to uh, the UK farming industry, I bet all of you would voted for it too. So in a way, those who argued abstain, well, that's the luxury of abstention, relying on the votes of others to get it through. And I just, I think that that is important to get across because they are two separate things. Brexit that was happening anyway, and the damage that's coming is happening anyway, and the TCA, which was marginally better than having no deal itself at all. Um, I agree with all of those who've talked about the importance of arguing for alignment. Now, of course, British businesses are going to have to align with EU rules to export. If the standards change in Europe and you're selling to Europe, you're going to have to follow them. That's quite simple. And if workers' rights uh, improve in Europe, then we as the labour movement, you bet, should be arguing really strongly that we should match those in the United Kingdom, not least because we will have members of our unions here in Britain who are working for companies that have workers in Britain and in other uh, European states. And the same is true of environmental uh, standards. Now, the government has claimed we don't intend to enter into a race to the bottom. We've got to hold them to that because there, there is this argument in the Tory party, as we know, between the deregulators who want to be Singapore on the other side of the channel and uh, others who I think recognise the political difficulty because I wouldn't like to turn up in the House of Commons now and argue for a weakening of workers' rights or environmental standards because I think you get very short shrift from quite a few people and not just uh, the Labour, Lib Dem and, uh, and uh, Green in the form of Caroline Lucas's opposition. So I think it's a long, hard struggle uh, for us because we have a mountain to climb. And I don't think uh, that Europe on its own is the answer. If somehow we adopted what some people on the call are arguing are the right policies in Europe, then somehow we win the next election. But I'm sorry to say, I don't believe that to be the case. Now, it's a much bigger question for an, a longer discussion on another uh, night, but we have to be honest about where we have arrived, how we got here, why we lost, and if we don't understand why we lost, then it's going to be very hard to be in a position to win in the future. And time is the other thing. I'm, I'm sorry for the length of the answer. Time uh, will bring a, a lot of things about. Um, and things can change. And the fact that we've, uh, people say, well, I, I don't know what uh, you stand for, as some people said over the weekend, in respect of this elections, uh, well, that I think will change as time unfolds. You can't make an instant change. That's a lesson from politics. You have to build a case, you have to build an argument, you have to build support. Great, thank you, Henry. Um, Lots to take in there. Right, we've got two more questions, uh, hands up. So I'll take those and then I'll come to each of the speakers with final comments and then we will finish up, unfortunately. So David and David, in fact. So David, Dave, Taylor Gooby, if you want to go first and if you can keep your questions okay. fairly short, uh, both Davids, that would be a real help. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, very quick in answer to what one or two said. Uh, I was in Hartlepool, Robert, and the, nobody mentioned Brexit. Everybody said to me they thought Labour was ineffective and hadn't delivered, so they were going to try something else. Now, there you are. Think about that. Um, what I, my question is this. I haven't got the full details yet because I've listened to bits of the radio and things about this Australia deal, but it seems a golden opportunity for us to show up the contradictions of Brexit, which seem to be, on the one hand, a rather shoddy Liz Trust type deal. She has to prove she can do deals all the time, which lets in cheaper food, but environmentally bad food. And at the same time, I think Minette Basso said, we'll put a lot of farmers out of business. Now, surely this is going to split the Tories. There will be an ideal thing for us to jump in on. I'd like Hillary and Co to comment on that. Great. Thank you, David. And David Blackman. Yes, Hillary. Uh, 
had had responded in a sense to comments that when I, I and my two others had made why we didn't have I still argued that we didn't have to vote for the TCA. Abstention, uh, it's, it's, you shouldn't dismiss it as just a cheap, easy alternative. It prevented the Tories from the cheap response that we voted for it. We voted for the deal. This is a simple level, but this is a simple level which the Tories have been so damned effective for a long time. I, I think, you know, uh, it's water under the bridge, but it's it, those of us who advocated hard, and I was bending Annalise Dodds here every week on this one, and I think she was one of the last to to advocate abstention. Uh, I still think it was wrong, and I don't. It's, it's not right to dismiss us for having advocated something cheap. My final sentence was, will be. Don't forget, we're still in the Council of Europe. I bore people on this one, but it's important we are still there. We need to make sure the Tories don't pull us out of that with the ECHR as well. Let's use that. That is one of the ways in which Labour has got to be active. We have MPs there. And this is a context in which we, we must show that we're still genuinely European. Thank you. Great. Thank you, David. Right, I'll come to each of you in turn. Um, final thoughts um, and thoughts too on the Australia deal and how that might impact and Council of Europe if you want to come on that too. So Natalie, can I come to you first, please? Well, sure. And to start with uh, David Blackman, I entirely agree about voting for the TCA in terms of that has real long term impacts in terms of what you look at, what the vote is, the Tories can brandish that and the rest of Europe sees that. Um, and picking up on the um, uh, Alan Hicks question about workers' rights and dynamic alignment, I'm somewhat less sanguine than Hillary about how difficult it's going to be to hold the line on what we've even got now, the standards we have now. I mean, the House of Lords, very weirdly, is now the centre of political resistance in Westminster. If you look at what happened, for example, in the Internal Market Bill, it was actually um, when the government just casually said, oh, we're going to break international law. It was actually through the leadership of the former Lord Chief Justice, um, who very, very unusually uh, from the crossbenchers, from the non-party position, came out in at the committee stage and got voted down the breaking international law parts of the internal market bill. And it was resistance in the Lords that was a major factor there. And we've been fighting you know, with the backing of things like a petition 1.5 million people have signed uh, led by the NFU, you know, as Labour backing, as Tory backing of a kind of organisation, as you can imagine, um, fighting to put clauses into the agriculture bill, the trade bill, um, the internal market bill to protect the standards we have now, let alone reach towards dynamic alignment. And the government, while keeping saying, oh, no, we're going to do it anyway, just refused, utterly held the line to keep those standards out. And the Australia deal, you know, its trade deal is a very clear reflection of that. And just to pick up on a couple of other points, um, I mean, it was Richard who said that, you know, there is very major differences in the position between the Greens and the um, Labour Party on Europe and on other things. Um, and you, we are in favour of rejoining the customs union, picking up a comment in the, uh, the chat from Roger, you, the impact on small businesses in the UK seeking to export has been absolutely enormous and the customs union would deal with lots of those problems, the problems in terms of the border down the middle of the Irish Sea, etc. Um, and just picking up lots of the comments about cultural exchange, I mean, that's what I started my comments on and someone else in, in the chat was saying, you know, focus on the plus part of Erasmus Plus. And that's where you know, I've put down written questions to the government. Um, yes, we're talking about sending students overseas with less financial backing than they had under Erasmus, but we've entirely lost that I have answers from the government just saying, oh, tough luck about the kind of exchange of teachers, exchange of lecturers, things that happen under Erasmus Plus that we've just lost entirely. And we've got to fight to, if we can't get them from Westminster, fight to build them up at a local level. So, and I really sort of want to finish with, with some of the things that Hillary said, both that I agree and disagree with. I think we absolutely have to listen to the people, the 52% of people who said they wanted to take back control in 2016. And right along the way, I said, yes, we have to understand the reasons for that. 
But the reasons for that don't rest in Brussels. They rest in decades of British politics, where we've had dominance of multinational companies, where we've had the privatisation of, of right to buy, where people have seen power and resources concentrated on Westminster and taken away from local regions, you know, something that's very evident across Yorkshire. Um, and so acknowledging that people were absolutely right to be angry, totally right to be fed up, um, but offer them different positive alternatives. And, you know, the practical reality is that um, there's a very good chance we will see um, Scotland become independent very soon. Wales is now indie curious. That's talking about people taking back control, local control. Um, we've got to build, we're going to have to face a very different United Kingdom. We have to try and do that positively while also maintaining, you know, decent relationships, being decent neighbours to um, the rest of Europe. And you know, we have an authoritarian far right government now. Um, that The Tory party is now the UKIP Brexit party. That's who's in control. And again and again, it's been shown that there is resistance in the Tory party. And the Tory party, I think, is every bit as unstable as the Labour party is. Um, you know, we're in a state of flux. So let's be positive about looking at building a different sort of Britain that has a very different kind of relationship with the EU and a relationship that's as close as possible. Brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, Natalie. And Richard, come to you, please, next. And then finally, I'll come to you, Hilary, in a minute. Thanks. I'd like to concentrate mainly on that question, uh, how does Labour win the next election? Um, I mean, from my perspective, the, the problem for Labour is that they're putting the cart before the horse, that they're, they're seeking to cobble together uh, the votes that they, they think they need to win the next election um, before they actually decide what it is that the, they're offering um, in terms of the product, in terms of the, the vision. Um, I think you should spend the next year or two getting the vision, which is in line with Labour values and in the values of, of the people who historically and in the future will support the Labour Party, and then, and then start to sell that vision. Uh, to me, that's the right approach to politics, especially when you have a little bit of time before the next election to do that. Um, just turning to the sort of raw sort of tactics of, of getting that, the number of votes, um, just look, the Conservatives, how have they got to the position they're in? They've done it fundamentally by completely hoovering up the Brexit Party UKIP vote, completely adopting their position and leaving no daylight and just sucking up all those votes. And that's fundamentally why they got the huge majority they got in December 2019. Uh, on the other side, we've got Labour, SNP, Lib Dem and Green fragmented votes. Um, I th as I've mentioned earlier, I think Progressive alliance is going to be very difficult if um, the, there are too much, there's too much difference policy-wise between those parties. Um, and from my point of view, particularly in respect to Brexit, but you could also talk about voting reform as well, whether the Labour Party are willing to um, move on that. Uh, if they were, then I think that might open some possibility for progressive alliance. Uh, but if, if, the Labour, if Labour wanted to learn a lesson from the Conservative Party, it would be to hoover up the votes of the progressives um, who are currently in a bit of a quandary and are drifting away to the Greens and the Lib Dems. I shouldn't say this because this would be against the interests of the Green Party that I'm a member of, but you know, to me, it seems obvious that the Labour Party, if they were able to be attractive to members of the Green Party and the Liberal Democrats, then they could do on the progressive side, what the Conservatives done on the non-progressive side. And that is to, probably the only way that Labour are going to get, uh, or that the progressive side, are going to be able to overpower um, the position that the Conservatives have put themselves into. Um, so I think that's all I've got to say, really. I mean, you know, I, I've been quite critical and I feel bad this is a Labour for a European Future event and I've been quite critical of the Labour Party, but I think I'm just uh, expressing the views of my group Leads for Europe uh, and, and the frustration that we feel and that we've felt over the past five years um, that, that nobody um, in a major party is representing the almost 50% of people who did not support Brexit 
Um, the people who support Brexit have plenty of um, oomph in terms of political representation, but those of us on the other side have had very little, unfortunately. Great. Thank you, Richard. And honestly, no need to apologise. We, we, we came here for a discussion between people with different viewpoints, and that's, that's the value of tonight's webinar. So thank you. It's good. We need to know what people think. Certainly, I, I do, as a, as a committed Labour person and a committed European. Uh, and last but very much not least, Hilary, uh, we'll come to you, please, for um, any thoughts on the Australia deal and then final comments. Uh, Mike, thanks. I was also going to say to Richard, uh, there's no need to apologise because hearing people being critical of Labour defines the experience of having been a Labour Party member since I was 17 years of age <laughs> when I joined the party in uh, in Kensington. So uh, that is in the nature of the enterprise because all parties are coalition and there's a, always a lively debate about what the right approach is. And when you're winning, there's slightly less debate. And when you've lost badly, there's slightly more debate because everyone has a different uh, view. Um, I would just, uh, Natalie, you referred to the dominance of, of multinational companies. Just to make a point that because we were members of the EU, it was multinational companies that revived the British car industry. And they're now turning to making electric vehicles. And the reason why the TCA mattered so much is if it hadn't been for that, there'd have been 10% tariffs on every one of the just under 2000 cars a day we export to Europe. So to say to, to, to David, I certainly hope I didn't use the word cheap. I just disagree with the argument for abstention. I mean, the European Parliament voted for the TCA. And unless you're going to argue if your vote would have made the difference, you still would have abstained and would have had no TCA at all, then I think in life and in politics, there comes a moment where you have to decide, are you in favor of something or not in favor of something? And saying, mm, I'm, I'm, I'm fearful I shall be compromised uh, and therefore I'd just rather abstain is not, I think, the right approach, but I respect those who took a different view. And if Boris Johnson says to any of us, oh, well, you voted for the deal. We say, uh, no, we voted for no tariffs for British manufacturing, which is why we voted for the TCA. Uh, we voted against Brexit, as you jolly well know, so I don't feel in the least bit compromised about that. The question about the Australia uh, trade deal, uh, David, that you uh, asked, um, is a very good one. It is striking that there is apparently this uh, argument uh, going on, but it is an early indication of the choices which this government is going to have to face in attempting to... Uh, replace the benefits of being part of the European Union in economic terms with trade deals negotiated by other countries, because this is just a taster for what uh, the United States of America is likely to ask for in a trade deal. And there you will probably find that the United States says, well, we want to allow these products in. And yes, it may be hormone injected beef and yes it may be chlorine Welsh chicken but you're going to have to take it if you want an agreement with the United States so uh, we're beginning to be confronted with the consequence in this case not about standards with Australia but about price and what is that going to do to British farmers but when it comes to the United States in particular then it will be about price but it will also be about standards and where will the current government uh, I think uh, end up. Um, the final point I wanted to make is, and I've really enjoyed this evening because, you know, all of the points that have been raised and all of these debates are, you know, live, they're real, they're difficult, there are different views, and we should do our darndest where we can agree to work to together to do that. But it is about, in my view, taking things in the right order. And it's a much more powerful campaign it seems to me to say why can't our artists go and perform in Europe and vice versa um, without all of this bureaucracy why do firms have to fill in all of this uh, paperwork why do you need export health certificates when you're just moving goods from one supermarket chain to a supermarket in another part of the United Kingdom um, how do you make sure that all European citizens get the full settled status that is their entitlement. And that's going to be a bit of an issue uh, if people forget to apply for settled status, having got pre-settled status, never mind the people who haven't yet applied for it with the deadline of, of June coming up. Now, those are all positive steps to make for a better 
closer relationship with our European friends and colleagues that we can get behind 100%, regardless of what we thought of the tactics and the views in the past, and regardless of where we think it will be possible to end up in however many years ahead. And I think that is the political task for now. And if we work together and can bring other people on board, including people who voted for Brexit, because if you say to somebody who voted for Brexit, well, would you like you know, British pop stars and great theatre companies from Britain to go and be able to tour in Europe uh, because we've got this, you know, a fantastic thing to offer and vice versa. I think you'd find a lot of people say, well, that sounds pretty sensible to me. So that is the way you begin to build alliances, including with the 52 percent who took a different view in that referendum. And I, I look forward to working with with all of you in, in trying to do that. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Hilarine. Thanks to Natalie and Richard as well. Uh, fascinating to listen to all of you, and thank you to all who contributed your questions uh, by speaking out loud in, uh, or uh, by posting them in the chat. And it's been great to see the chat very, very active as well. Um, just one comment from me. I was on a webinar yesterday, and this is relevant. One of the speakers said that, uh, I mean, he's a Labour person, but he was criticising all of us as progressives for spending far, far more time talking about how we're going to take votes from each other rather than talking about how we're going to take votes from the Conservative Party. And I thought it was actually quite a fair comment because I, I spend way more of my time talking about the validity or you know not validity of progressive alliances than I do talking to people about how we're going to convince some people who voted Conservative last time not to vote Conservative next time, which is actually the question because yep. one vote off there, so one in our column, is worth double. you know. And uh, I, was look I saw some stats as well today saying I think it was... And I kind of knew this anyway, but it was it was something over 13 million people voted Conservative in 2019, something over 10 million people voted Labour. We need to be thinking about how we're going to take those 3 million votes away from the Conservatives and in my view, of course, put them in the Labour column. But if some of them go in, in other columns and take seats elsewhere that Labour isn't in a position to win, then that, that makes the world a better place as well. So that, well, let's think about that as, as we go as we go on our way. Anyway, thank you so much for joining tonight. Great to see you. Uh, we have uh, more events coming up listed on our Facebook page, which I posted in the chat. Uh, I think I'm pretty sure you can become a member of Leeds for Europe. Um, and yes, you can. And you can become a member of Labour for European Future as well. And you'd be very welcome to do both. Uh, and obviously, you will probably have your political affiliation sorted out. But if you haven't, you can pick from the Green Party and the Labour Party based on tonight's based on tonight's discussion. Um, thank you so much, everybody. Great to see you. And please stay safe in these uh, uncertain times. And we will see you soon. Bye for now. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. Bye-bye.